So I'm Celia Moss. I'm an honorary consultant at Birmingham Children's Hospital, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the 12th annual Stuart Green Memorial Lecture and our first time on Zoom. We are recording the lecture, so if you don't want to be recorded, then you can switch off your camera. For the benefit of the, those among you who didn't know uh, Stuart, uh, he was a pioneer internationally in paediatric neurology and he set up paediatric neurology at Birmingham Children's Hospital and ran the department. Um, he was a much valued and loved colleague and friend. He was wise, kind and has been said eccentric, delightfully so. After Stuart died, we set up this annual lecture in his memory and also renamed the lecture theatre after him. And it's a great pleasure to have Stuart's family, Margaret, Mark, Ben, and the rest of the, the family with us this evening. It's great to see old friends. And normally this is a very sociable occasion and um, we do miss the social interaction. That's one of the lovely things about this lecture, but we have allowed for that. And at the end, we're gonna keep the uh, Zoom open for about 20 minutes. Mark will organize some breakout rooms and the plan is to have 10 breakout rooms. So if you want to arrange with a friend to meet in a particular number breakout room, uh, Mark will explain more about that at the end. So over to our speaker now. So Sarah Lippitt is a gifted artist and writer. I first heard her speak at the Royal College of Pediatrics and I immediately thought she would be perfect for the Stuart Green Lecture. She puts across very eloquently in words and pictures the experience of being a child with a rare neurological disease and she was in fact a patient of Stuart's as you will hear and um, we're very much looking forward to your talk Sarah and I didn't ask you about taking questions but perhaps if people want to put some questions in the chat you might take them afterwards. So, thank Sarah, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen if you just tell me Celia that you can see it when I share so let's see. Um, and I could go for. Can you see that everyone? Yes, I can see that that's fine. Wonderful okay let me just move this. Um, so yes, as Celia says, I'm Sarah Lippitt and I'm really um, pleased to be able to finally um, give this talk that Celia kindly invited me to give last year, um, which obviously been postponed and now online. Um, so thanks so much and thanks to, um, uh, I'm going to call, <laughs> I can't call him Stuart because to me it was always Dr Green, so <laughs> the Dr Green's family for, for allowing me to speak as well. Um, so uh, I'm an illustrator, graphic novelist, and, and I'm also a lecturer at Edinburgh College of Art. Um, I guess I'm most well known for my graphic novels, which is combining words and pictures. Um, I like to create work that um, with meaningful content that, uh, that sort of shares and discusses quite serious issues. The most recent um, is my A Puff of Smoke that came out at the end of uh, 2019. Um, uh, which, as Celia uh, mentioned, um, shares my story of growing up with an undiagnosed uh, neurological uh, disease. So I'm going to share that story now, um, of which um, Dr. Green does appear in, <laughs> um, and um, uh, th through through some of the images from the book. Um, so very sort of summarised version of, of of the whole content. Um, so I grew up in a very sort of busy, bustling household. Um, as one of five, I'm I'm the one in the pink in the front. Um, um, we grew up. I grew up in Stafford in the Midlands, in a quiet part of the town called Wildwood. Um, and when my little sister was born, um, I was seven years old, and um, I started noticing changes. Um, I started dropping things. I started falling over. Um, I had some pains in my head and some tingling sensations in the in down the left hand side of my body. And originally, my parents sort of thought, oh, well, perhaps um, she's just jealous of the baby. That's why she's falling over and doing these things as, as you would as a parent. Um, but eventually they realized that something really wasn't right. And um, they, they, they took me outside to go for a little walk and closely monitored to see what was happening and realized that and I went to the GP who said that I needed to go straight to the hospital. So we went to the local hospital and uh, Dr. C there, she said that uh, um, they couldn't help me at the local hospital. I needed to go to Birmingham Children's Hospital where they could do the tests that they needed to do to discover what was going on with me. 
by this point, the left-hand side of my body started moving around on its own. Um, I had a lot of weakness on that side of the my body. The, the pain in my head had got a lot, lot worse. And um, I was in quite a, quite a bad way. When I arrived at um, Birmingham Children's Hospital, I was put in an isolated room. And uh, my parents had to leave that night to go back to the rest of the family, take care of them. And I was left on my own for the first time in my life, feeling very, very frightened. And I remember being in this isolated room and looking out through the window and seeing people talking about me and things happening, but not really knowing what was going on with me or understanding the, these conversations that were happening about me. Um, and this is where Dr. Green appeared in my life. <laughs> I remember feeling incredibly unwell and being wheeled along in the wheelchair. And I remembered his distinct look that he, I think my family, all thought that he was a um, a professor and that we kind of imagined that one reflection that he was this mad professor character with his, with his bow tie and I remember very distinctly looking up at him as a child and thinking he was that kind of char eccentric character with these grey um, wiry hairs in his nostrils <laughs> and not being able to do what he asked me to do and obviously because I was incredibly unwell um, and initially he thought um, I had a brain tumour, so I had lots of um, tests, including an MRI, um, which came back. And I remember specifically um, my parents telling me about waiting for this, to, you know, to find out whether I had a brain tumour or not, and him being a bit late. And I remember uh, Dr. Green's, his, his, his coat was sort of a floating, because he's always in a hurry of, you know, this constantly caring for people and, and the next thing and the next thing. Um, but fortunately it wasn't a brain tumour, but they still didn't know what was wrong with me. Um, but the good news is, was that I wasn't contagious. I didn't think I was contagious. So they, um, uh, I was allowed to go back onto the ward, um, and out of my isolation room, which was much, much better. And I remember, uh, lying there in the hospital bed and looking over and seeing um, my neighbour, this young boy, and um, he was very, very sick. My mum told me at the time that uh, the boy's uh, body had rejected his new kidney and he was, he, was, he was very, very ill. And his family were very, very kind to me. And when my parents couldn't be there because they had such, you know, they I had to take care of the rest of the children, um, they would always come over to me and, uh, and you know, give me sweets and, and make sure I was okay. And, were incredibly kind. And it was the first time in my life, um, quite devastatingly, that I realised that children could die and children could pass on. Um, that one of those nights in the hospital, um, the curtains were drawn around him and he, and he passed away. Um, and around that time was uh, about a few days later, as my, my neighbour um, on the ward had passed on from the world, I was given this strange diagnosis of what I sound thought sounded quite odd of hemiplegia crea, which is an involuntary um, uh, movement disorder. Um, and I was given a, an enormous amount of medication and, and sent home um, in the hope that, you know, we'd get the balance right and uh, eventually it would be controlled. So I went back home and I remember initially getting home and seeing this big basket of fruit that uh, you know, a really kind grocer had had delivered into to our house, and being really angry at the fruit. Like, why would any kid want fruit as a gift? You know, you want sweets and chocolate, and that being really infuriating. And my um, sisters and my brother pushing me in my wheelchair around, and how, that being quite good fun. At least I had that. Um, and I went back to school part time, but I was moved um, over to the table with all the other struggling kids. I had very you know, um, a high achiever and and been with all the popular kids and then suddenly I had been moved over to this new table um, having been away for over six months um, next to the kid that thought he was a robot making robot noises and being really infuriated <laughs> by him him the whole time but very much an eye-rolling kid um, at that point um, but with some medication changes from Dr Green and some physio um, I could walk again and what remained of the illness I had, I, I used to find ways to hide. So I, it still sort of hung around in my hand that would move around quite a lot. And I took it under my right arm so you couldn't see. And I was um, 
yeah, given a new doctor, Dr. W, who'd been treating me a bit at Birmingham, but um, now Dr. Green sort of moved on to, to more complicated cases, I expect, and I was with uh, Dr. W. Um, and I saw Dr. C in Stafford, and uh, this is where things got a little bit more complicated. Um, I started getting urine infections, and they, they were quite regular, and so Dr. C um, sent me to a renal specialist. Um, I still wasn't well neurologically, as in the you know the movement was still there in my arm, and my hand, and most people at school, you know, as they do very quickly, <laughs> and if you're gone for a few days, will forget you and move on to new friends. But I had one friend that hadn't forgotten me, um, my friend Catherine. Very excitedly, I, I was invited to her birthday party, and um, my mum went over to her mother to tell her, you know, how grateful she was that uh, Catherine had invited her to this party and how excited I was to finally get some normality back into my life. And, uh, you know, people are afraid of, often afraid of illness and um, her mum uh, was and she didn't want illness in her house. And so, um, you know, that, that friendship kind of frazzled and I had to rely on again, um, as usual with my wonderful family of have being one of five of having siblings as my my best friends to hang out with. Um, meanwhile, um, I was referred to um, Dr. Halton. I think Dr. Halton is here today, which is really wonderful. My favourite doctor from my childhood. I have to say sorry, Dr. Green. <laughs> um, and she put me on some antibiotic to deal with my um, uh, my infections and I remember um, having more tests done because they were trying to find out why I was getting these infections what was going on with me and I had to do lots of urine in samples to check my protein levels and being very excited about that because I got to store them in the fridge and you know really um upset my big sister because she thought it was absolutely disgusting that um I had to store my urine in the fridge next to the milk she was going to have for her cereal um and I was starting high school and I was feeling a bit more optimistic. I was thinking, well, it was a fresh start. I can make new friends and they wouldn't know um, what had happened to me that I'd been in a wheelchair. They wouldn't have known that um, necessarily by the look of me that I was an ill person. Um, the movement in the hand, had, they got the levels right with the medication and it was controlled and it was right. So I had a new chance to try and uh, make friends and I made a really good friend what well, finally a really good friend who didn't see me just as an illness they also saw me as a person that that was fun that was an individual and understood that it you know that I did have illness but it was okay so um uh, Dr Halton gave me a biopsy to find out what was happening at this point um to to uncover what was going on there and um I remember this specifically being a teenager is quite different to being ill as an adult in that you know you very you sort of bypass the illness in a way in these conversations that sort of throw away and these conversations are really important for me to put in the book and the way that you speak to one another when you're a kid and you're, and you're ill and that you talk about it one minute and the next minute you're talking about gossip at school and it's very much in with the conversation yeah. it's not a big deal it's not uh, not treated in that way um so the results came in and it wasn't great news. I'd, um, they'd discovered I had kidney disease, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, and that they needed to um, focus on trying to uh, deal with the nephrotic syndrome. So getting rid of um, st stopping my kidneys um, uh, leaking so much protein. So they put me on um, cyclophosphamide. So I used to go to the hospital uh, for, it was every six weeks of, for three sessions of intravenous treatment um, and I remember being you know, really really sort of developing my drawing at this point and writing children's books and things and being very involved in and in it would take me out of my illness and so when I went for intravenous treatment I remember specifically requesting to have my intravenous treatment in my left hand so that I could still draw with my right um, and I'll come back to this, but I, I remember very, very vividly speaking to this girl on the ward who told me never ever to take steroids, which was another treatment that I could have taken. Um, but to me, that steroid treatment had too many side effects. So I was happy just to have the side effect that meant that my hair would fall out a bit, which did get me into some, you know, there was still the effects of that um, were affecting my daily life and that just stupid things like boys pulling your hair, you know, 13 years old, and my hair would just come out because it was so loose from the treatment, um, but it did work and um, I was stabilized 
Um, my kidneys got stabilized um, through um, blood pressure medication after the nephrotic syndrome. Um, but unfortunately, around that time, um, neurologically, things had taken a turn for the worse and um, sim my symptoms had come back. But it wasn't the same symptoms. It wasn't the movement disorder anymore. I had migraines, severe migraines on the right hand side of my head. And I had tingling sensations and weakness on the left hand side of my body. And uh, Dr. W um, gave me a lot of migraine treatment for this to try and uh, um, abate it. And obviously there's lots of side effects involved in that as well. Um, but it went on and on and on. And every time we went to the hospital, we tried more treatments that weren't working and there was no diagnosis. I'd have MRI after MRI and EEGs and other people would come in, other neurologists and see if they could try and help, but it wasn't working and everything was inconclusive. And I was now coming into my GCSE year at school and I was missing school. Um, the only the only thing that came up in the MRI scan results was that they did discover finally that the reason why I, I had career, they think, was that I had a stroke around seven. The MRI show indicated this, um, but with that information, it was a bit strange. Well, you know, we didn't we weren't sure what that meant in re relation to the symptoms I was receiving. There was no real connection to that. They couldn't understand why I was still feeling the way I was, and everything just got worse and worse. I was more lethargic, more as in more and more pain with my migraines. And I could hear life continuing for my siblings outside of my room, but I was there in darkness with no life at all. Um, and by 1999, I was 15, 16, I couldn't sleep, I was anxious and I was angry. I was really angry at my sister in particular because she was the closest in age to me, my older sister that she had a real life. She had things that she did. She had friends and she had, she was really good at school and I was com being compared to her at school because teachers didn't really understand what was wrong with me and it now being an invisible illness really to them. And, you know, why wasn't I as smart as her? Um, and I, but because I was never there. And I specifically remember the, at this time being incredibly unwell and there's loads and loads of, uh, medications at this point and my nan coming around and saying telling me well I don't need to worry because I just need to find a good man and marry him and then I won't have to do anything and I just remember thinking oh my god like that's the last thing I want I want a life for me I want to be somebody I want to do things and being determined that I had to get better um and my mum and dad were very frustrated and didn't know what to do and they were phoning um Dr W non-stop not getting any answers and as a last resort my parents took all of my medication to the pharmacist who we by that point we knew very very well because we were always in there my mum was on first name terms with him and uh, uh showed him the medication i was on and i was on adult dosages way over the the recommended allowance for someone of my age and uh, the combination of the drugs were just uh, not compatible and fighting each other in that and that's why I was so so sick so I um went back into hospital and um they would gradually wean me off all of my medication to start from scratch to see what you know look and have have more tests again and get my strength back up and being in the hospital school um compared to being at my own school was really great in a way because finally I was in a place where um, you know, it didn't matter what you looked like or what was wrong with you or what was happening. I could wear my EEG wires on cables on my head and no one would bat an eyelid. You know, there were kids with metal held up, holding their heads together and other kids who, you know, had personality disorders. I had one, one kid who thought he was, um, Austin Powers and would shout out, um, I am a sexy beast in the middle of class, but everyone just got on with their work and it was just, it was just accepted. And, and that was, you know, temporarily kind of a wonderful thing um, to feel like you fitted in. Um, going back to school um, after that, um, I was in my final GCSE, GCSE um, year, um, which was very, very difficult to catch up. Um, but with the support of my friend and 
um, family, I got through it and I managed to um, pass my GCSEs and go on to, to do study art at A-level after that. Uh, meanwhile, we're still going to the hospital and still not getting any answers and I'm still juggling this, uh, whatever this thing is that's wrong with me. And finally, uh, we had one last appointment with Dr. W, um, at, at which point he I was obviously so overwhelmed with work. Um, having spoken to Dr. W since um, since this point, and most recently, like when I was doing my research for the book, um, he did tell me how um, strained the neurological department was at this point. Um, and called me Emily and and started looking through more drugs and not really still not really looking for the answer, not looking for the diagnosis, but treating the symptoms. And um, quite rightly so, my my dad um, lost his temper and decided that we needed to go and somewhere else and look for a second opinion. And we went to Great Ormond Street Hospital and they took on the case, my case and uh, with fresh eyes and started looking for an answer and they did same same tests that Birmingham had done but maybe a few others that they hadn't done and or revisited and um, meanwhile I was getting more and more into art and drawing and taking life drawing classes and I was getting into music and trying to finally find an identity for myself that wasn't just the illness. I dyed my hair black and um, when I could I did the best I possibly could to just completely absorb myself in this amazing world of literature and music and art. Um, and we had one final test, one final trip with my dad up to London. Uh, sorry, I say up to London, uh, down to London, it's from the Midlands. <laughs> and um, I had an angiogram and uh, I remember them not really explaining very well in the hospital what was going to happen to me. And uh, waking up after the angiogram um, and not knowing why I didn't have my pants on anymore. And the nurse handing me back the pants in a see-through envelope in front of my dad. I was 17 by this point and being absolutely like devastated that that was um, happening to me. And then finally they were explaining what had happened to me in, in that when you have an angiogram, you they, they do inject dye into your groin and that's why your pants are missing. And, but yeah, if there's if there's any technicians listening, don't do that. <laughs> Explain it. Um, and uh, I was away, I think, um, for a, for a night or so. I was allowed to well enough to go to a festival, and I remember coming home, and the hospital had phoned, and Mum had received the information, and um, they finally diagnosed me. They'd finally found the answer, and. Um, they diagnosed me with Moya Moya, um, which is a very rare disease, affects one in one million people in the UK. Um, it's a progressive disease that affects the blood vessels in the brain, and it's characterised by the narrowing of a major artery in the skull that delivers blood to the brain. And they were offering me the chance to get better, um, potentially, and have a brain surgery, which would revascularise the blood flow. And um, that was a decision that was up to me whether I wanted to have it or not. Or I would be continuing to have TIAs and um, suffer with the pains and potentially have another stroke. And my brother, I remember him cheering up, cheering me up about it in the only way he knew how, which was uh, making up a song about Moya Moya on the piano. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I decided to have the surgery. And um, much to my mum's dismay, I remember being very, very sort of... Uh, teenage about it and writing down songs to play at my funeral because I was adamant that you know there's a very high chance that I might die so I wanted the you know the pixies being played there at where is my mind I thought that would go down really well at my funeral because it would be funny um and I'd had brain surgery so brain related songs would be hilarious I don't think my mum found the funny side of it at the time um so a couple of months later I went into hospital and um, I was uh, given the surgery and uh, and I woke up finally age 18, having been, uh, <laughs> uh, had the first symptoms at age seven. Um, 
had my surgery and it was, uh, I didn't know at the time when this picture was taken, but it was a successful surgery and I still do suffer uh, sometimes with symptoms from it, but very, very sporadically in comparison. Um, I haven't had any symptoms from it for a couple of years now. Um, and uh, in a lot of the reviews I've had from my book and some people commenting have asked me, why, um, why this picture at the end of the book? And why didn't you want to continue the story and say, you know, all the great things you've done since you left, uh, since you've, you know, you, you, you had the surgery. And it was very important to me to sort of emphasize, and I, th I hope that it does in this photograph, that um, when you live with a, um, diseases, like I have the two diseases that I live with, um, there isn't a cure for any of it. It's ongoing, it's chronic, it lasts for, until I die. Um, it's never going to go away, it's lifelong. I'm always going to have to be monitored. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes it comes back. And um, last September, um, my kidney disease came back with a bit of a vengeance. Um, I had a nephrotic relapse back in September. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the girl who warned me against the steroids um, when I was a teenager, I was put on to the steroids um, for my nephrotic um, relapse for FS FSGS. And as usual, and the only way I know how, and then the only way that um, has saved me in so many ways art drawing and writing has saved me and um through this new relapse i have been channeling my energy into a, in a cathartic way i suppose um to cope with it by drawing and writing about what has been happening to me and um that is in quite a similarly to the puff of smoke in a humorous way but also in a quite um in, in that, that sort of moving way in the way you're trying to deal with things I just wanted to share a few things that I've been drawing with you now. So this is uh, when I was at sort of some of the worst last autumn. I mean, having a, um, a relapse is bad enough, but having a relapse during a pandemic as well is kind of doubly worse. <laughs> and I, I were lying awake with insomnia, the side effects of the steroid, and uh, it would be like 3 a.m. in the morning. And, uh, you know, this I just processing I can't get comfortable. I had so many, I had urine infections all the time and I hated the steroid, what it did to me. Um, and strangely, I kept, uh, I was attracted to Phil Collins as a not, to, not, to, not physically, but to his music. And I'd never, I'd always been a proper music snob and listened to very experimental stuff. And all I got was Phil Collins in my head. I was obsessed with singing and it calmed me down. And I was desperate that, why was it Phil Collins that was going to help me get through this, uh, my symptoms? I wanted it to be a cool Philip, uh, like, you know, Philip Glass. Um, and I'll just read you another page from, some pages from my, um, my sort of diary, really, um, of how I've been coping with it. I wake up at 3.30am every day, and sometimes I sob in the bath, mourning my old body. My days are long and strange, but I'm never bored. The red sunrise was so beautiful this morning. You put on your winter coat and ate breakfast on our balcony. You said, maybe the sea has healing powers. And we laughed. I scream out my frustrations and they're carried away. Um, and I'm just going to end on a, on a funnier one, which is, um, I live by the sea now. I moved just before I relapsed, so everything's quite new to me and exciting, and especially living by the beach. And I, so a lot of my work is based around um, my environment because that's where I've been sort of trapped and shielding. And it was very much, uh, uh, you know, I got to the critical point so many times when, you know, I'm not getting into remission with my disease and I just want to dig a hole and get in it. <laughs> and I think that's fair enough. Um, but I'm going to lastly sort of talk about the impact of the book and how important that is and how it sort of changed the relationship between me and my illness and writing this book was important to me because I wanted it to be something um, that would resonate with um, children and teenagers and adults really as something a resource for them for when you're feeling isolated and lonely like you're not getting anywhere that maybe reading someone else's story might help 
And I think particularly when you're not well and you don't really want to read an enormous amount of writing an essay, um, this kind of work really, really um, can speak to people and and also in a way that the visual element, when maybe you perhaps can't write the words that can express something, you can visualise it incredibly well and it can really resonate. Um, so it's, done, it's been quite successful, but um, above any of the criti you know, critical claim, um, the way I've been sharing my own work and my books um, the feedback I get from individuals has been the most important to me. Um, so, for example, when I, I spoke on Woman's Hour, BBC Woman's Hour, when the book came out and a doctor got in touch with me, um, who said, and it just it, it brought me to tears, actually, that, you know, I'll, I'll just say the line, your book made me realise what care requires of patients. We tend to see the episodes of care. The impact on your daily life is invisible to us. We are also very focused on those episodes of what we have to do. I will endeavour to remember your story when I am consulting my patients. And I think it's really important that patients can share the, the, their journey because it's not just about uh, the symptoms, it's also about the life that you're trying to lead outside of that. Um, I'm making my comics recently, the new ones about my relapse and sharing those on social media has even brought uh, you know people to me that are dealing with similar things. Um, and. Um, that resonating with other people and then people talking to me makes me feel less alone, but it also hopefully makes them feel less alone as well. Um, and I will continue to do this, hopefully, <laughs> and continue to share the story and continue to try and challenge um, perspectives of doctors um, and try and change attitudes towards um, patient care. Um, uh, and that's it. <laughs> I'm going to end there. So. Um, any questions um, I'm willing to take now? You can speak out or you can um, type into the chat. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. That was really powerful and moving and you've really given us a fantastic impression really of the impact on daily life of having a serious and particularly undiagnosed rare disease. It was really very, very powerful. So I don't know if anyone has any questions. You can put them in the chat or you can uh, unmute yourself. Sally, uh, Sally Holton. Oh, Sarah. Hello, Sally. <laughs> Sarah, hello. I'm so delighted to see you in this way and so apologetic that it's not in physical form. I obviously have your book and I had wanted you to write in it. I bought it at the very start, but um, I just want to say how how moving I thought the book was and also how incredible your book has been today. But it is truly about the other part of the patient, not just the person who's in the room with you. And it's all the other part of your life that I found so moving. And you know, your family, how they had to support you and how your friends stood to you when you're ill and nobody wants to know when it's too much trouble. And and I think that we have to learn all of these things. And I thought you spoke so eloquently about it. And I think it's most important that we learn from your, um, from your experience and continue to learn. And I just am so delighted that you've had art and literature to help you go through this because it is a method of trying to stay connected and sane with the real world. And I think you're amazing. And I think you're a real inspiration to all of us. And I'm just so grateful that you came to talk to us and I wish you all the best. I'm so sorry you've had a relapse, but I'm sure that things will come right for you. You've got enormous resilience and I have complete faith in you. Thank you. Thank you. I can absolutely e echo all that, that Sally said. And um, I think one of the nice things and the things that thing that will appeal to children is the kind of rude bits, you know, the fact the bit about your knickers in a plastic bag, and <laughs> things like that. I think those are those will particularly resonate. And, you know, the cringing embarrassment that you felt. So there yeah. are messages appearing in the chat and we will save the chat for you. I, I had a question for you, Sarah. And thank you so much. It's just amazing to see it from this point of view, which is just so underrepresented, I think. Uh, did it? Did writing the book 
do for you what you expected it to do. So really what I'm asking is what did you expect it would do for you and what did it do for you? And was there much of a difference or surprise in what happened? Uh, I, I wanted to write it initially for, like I said, for kids like me um, that felt isolated, but were also very, very shy. Because I know there's groups out there that you can go to, but I was always one of those kids that didn't couldn't handle that. And um, I... And that was my main goal. And then it completely um, shifted because I just didn't, I had no, I had no, I didn't realise what a massive impact it would have on the medical community in general in that um, sharing this story and meeting all these, like such a wide group of people that it's meant so much to and change the perspectives of. And I also didn't realise that it was going to change my relationship with my illnesses. I was hiding from it. I was always hiding from it and not wanting to talk about it because I was really stable for a long time. Um, you know, once I'd had the surgery, I was running marathons and everything. Not not at the moment. I'm not very well, but I was really well. And I, I was hiding from it. And then when I was right, decided to write the book, I embraced it. And I was like, it's okay. Like, it shouldn't be a taboo thing. It shouldn't be something, or we can't talk about illness. No one wants to talk about that. We should be open about it and discuss it because... There's, there's nothing worse than feeling isolated and vulnerable and alone. And um, that's really, it's been amazing for me in that way. Um, and also I think it was much more cathartic than I expected. I mean, I, I got an apology from Dr. W um, three times in an email. I never met him in person again, but I, I spoke to him on email. So that was also unexpected and sort of, and really sort of cathartic in dealing with that sort of side of things as well. Um, and realising that he's a person and that people do make mistakes was an important lesson for me, I think, yeah. And, and, and for doctors as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's interesting because we saw, we saw the other side of it because, I mean, I, I don't know, CD you might know better, how many pediatric neurologists there are now in BCH. But yeah. for many, many years, it was just dad and Dr. W. And it, well, indeed, before that, it was just that. And they had to campaign for a long, long time to try and get extra people to come in, which they did. But it was, we saw it from that side of things. And to hear about the fact that it affects patients and patients are aware of it is yeah. re really important for the medical community to know because it's not just about the pressure on the doctors. It's also about the way it manifests itself. Yes. In the patients as well. So thank you for that. I think we have got Raj Gupta on the call and Evangeline Wasma, who are paediatric neurologists currently. I don't know whether, Raj, would you like to say something? Yeah, I think, thank you very much, Sarah. It was, it was a fantastic um, journey that you went through, that you went through with us today. Um, I think it's truly inspirational. And the interesting thing is that you, not just told your journey and how difficult it was for you and your family, but you actually helped demonstrate to us how we can do things better. Um, and that's at many different levels. So I think it's extreme, extreme, extremely important lessons for us all that you've taught us today. Um, and I think the difficulties that you faced over the years, unfortunately are still being faced by patients today. Um, so I think we do need to sort of reflect on how we do things and improve um, the patient journeys um, that we are actually sort of taking our patients through. So thank you very much for being so courageous and thank you very much for sort of telling us how it was and how it is, because we will learn lots from you and um, hopefully that we will improve things for patients who come now on. So thank you very much indeed. So Sarah, there are lots more thank yous in the chat and we all are very, very grateful to you. And I'm going to close the formal part of the meeting now. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mark Green in a moment to say a few words, but thank you very much, Sarah. You've more than fulfilled my expectations and I look forward to your next book eagerly. Thank you, over thank to you. Mark. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah, on behalf of uh, the family and the, the the board as we are of people who organize this lecture it's just been wonderful to have this 
completely brand new point of view and see especially how your talent has been able to express things for and inspire other people, help you and, and be the source of this lecture as well. It, it's wonderful and we're so, so grateful to you. And we were going to have you last year, as you know, not many people may know that. And of course that was canceled. So thank you for hanging in there and for agreeing to do it in this way. And actually it's a fantastic way, particularly for your medium of doing it because we could really see everything up close and personal. So very, very grateful for that. I also would like to say on behalf of the family and on behalf of dad, uh, thank you a million times to Professor Celia Moss, who has been running the show uh, <clears throat> since the beginning. Dad died <clears throat> 15 years ago and we've had, this is the 12th lecture we've had. Uh, they've always been so well attended. It's not only wonderful for uh, the people who come, because it's always managed to get a really good balance between something that's interesting for medics, but also something that is accessible for, let's call ourselves educated lay people, shall we? Uh, and and we've, with Celia at the helm, we've managed to get that balance uh, uh, every single time. And dad would have been so proud and so, flattered and also so fascinated he would have had a, he would have had a million questions for you Sarah he really would <laughs> he would have remembered things he would have commented on uh, his representation uh, pictorially uh, he would have quite liked it actually I think I think but, he would have because uh, he was a big Doctor Who fan he would have been quite amused that he was almost portrayed as this Doctor Who like character <laughs> He would have. And he definitely would have commented on his lack of hair because he always had a lot of hair. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, he would have he would have loved it. And he would have he was always very patient centric. And so the idea of the just concept of this would have been wonderful for him. But Celia is uh, after very much a long time at the helm is stepping down as the leader. We are being uh, led going forward by Professor Raj Gupta, who uh, I know will have both our support and Celia's support and the rest of the board. We're very grateful for him. And, but we really wanted to express how, uh, how it would have, wouldn't have happened in the way it did without you, Celia. You've been wonderful, You're, as well as being so super organized, you always manage to find uh, connections with dad and have so many fond and amusing memories of him which are both funny and respectful, which is quite a de delicate balance to get. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to present you with something separately, uh, which will uh, hopefully enhance your new garden in London, uh, just as a small token of our appreciation. But uh, we are very, very thankful and thankful too to Raj for continuing. So, and thank you to you all, everyone here for attending and making this uh, another very well attended, well over a hundred people uh, and popular lecture again. And global. And global, yes. We've got visitors from all over the world uh, and uh, it's, it's lovely to be able to have people who otherwise wouldn't have been able to be here. So there is some advantage of it too. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, put people, uh, open the breakout room so I've opened all the rooms now. You can, you can go into uh, those rooms yourself. Uh, we will flit in between them if you want to. Uh, there's, uh, you'll see for the people who aren't uh, so au fait with things, I have uh, opened all those rooms. You should at the bottom of your screen be able to see it says breakout rooms. If you don't, you, it means you might not have the latest version of Zoom. I'm sorry about, sorry about that if that's the case. Uh, but do uh, try and do that. I will, at the same time, if people aren't able to do it, assign people to some rooms and we will go and say hello. But again, thank you very much to you, Sarah. Thank you to you, Celia. And thank you for everyone for attending. Could I just also say thank you to Ruth Whitcomb, who's done yes. a of, uh, Sorry, Ruth. Yeah. Thank you, so, thank you so Thanks, much Ruth. to Ruth and also Thank to Karen who's been pleasure. behind the scenes. It's been, uh, it's been so smooth. So thank you very much. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Mm. Mm.